Hello and welcome to a reading of uh, John Milton's Paradise Lost, um, all 12 books. What I'm going to do over the coming months is uh, simply read through uh, the poem um, and maybe giving a um, analysis as well. Uh, my name is Cathy Williams de Vries. I studied this as part of my graduate diploma in Shakespeare studies and uh, I've read it all and I wanted to share uh, the joy I've found um, with this work with you all on YouTube. So um, the measure is English heroic verse without rhyme, without rhyme as that of Homer in Greek and of Virgil in Latin. Um, rhyme being no necessarily adjunct or true ornament of poem or good verse, uh, in longer works especially, but the invention of a barbarous age to set off wretched matter and lame metre, graced indeed since by the use of some mo famous modern poets, carried away by custom but much to their own vexation, hindrance and constraint to express many things otherwise. Uh, and for the most part, worse than else they would have expressed them. Not without cause, therefore, some both Italian and Spanish poets of prime note have rejected rhyme both in longer and shorter works, as have also long since our best English tragedies, as a thing of itself to all judicious ears, trivial and of no true musical delight, which consists only in up numbers fit quantity of syllables and the sense variously drawn out from one verse into another, and not in the jingling sound of like endings, a fault avoided by the learned ancients both in poetry and all good oratory. This neglect then of rhyme, so little is to be taken for a defect, though it may seem so perhaps to vulgar readers, that it is rather to be esteemed an example set, the first in English, of ancient liberty recovered to heroic poem from the troublesome and modern bondage of rhyming. So we go with book one, The Argument. This first book proposes, first in brief, the whole subject, man's disobedience, and the loss thereupon of paradise wherein he was placed, then touches the prime cause of his fall, the serpent, or rather Satan in the serpent, who, revolting from God and drawing to his side many legions of angels, was by the command of God driven out of heaven with all his crew into the great deep. Which action passed over, the poem hastes into the midst of things, presenting Satan with his angels now fallen into hell, described here, not in the centre, for heaven and earth may be supposed as yet not made, certainly not yet accursed, but in a place of utter darkness, fitly as called chaos. Here Satan with his angels lying on the burning lake, thunderstruck and astonished, after a certain space recovers, as from confusion, Pulls up him who next in order and dignity lay by him. They confer of their miserable fall. Satan awakens all his legions who lay till then in the same manner confounded. They rise. Their numbers array of battle. Their chief leaders named according to the idols known afterwards in Canaan and the countries adjoining. To these Satan directs his speech. Comfort, com comforts them with hope yet of regaining heaven but tells them lastly of a new world, a new kind of creature to be created, according to an ancient prophecy or report in heaven, for that angels were long before this visible creation was the opinion of many ancient fathers. To find out the truth of this prophecy and what to determine thereon, he refers to a full council. What his associates then attempt? Pandemonium, the, place, uh, the palace of Satan rises, suddenly built out of the deep, the infernal peers there sit in council. So we begin the poem. Of man's first disobedient and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing heavenly muse that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos or of Sion hill delight thee more, and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song, that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Ionian, Ionian mount, 
while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme, and chief, chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me, for thou knowest, thou from the first was present, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like sats brooding on the vast abyss, and madest it pregnant. What in me is dark, illumine? What is low, raise and support, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence, and justify the ways of God to men? Say first, for heaven hides nothing from thy view, nor the deep tract of hell. Say first what cause moved our great parents in this happy state, favoured of heaven so highly to fall off from their creator and transgress his will for one restraint, lords of the world besides who first seduced them to that foul revolt, the infernal serpent. Here it was whose guile, stirred up with envy and revenge, deceived the mother of mankind, what time his pride had cast him out from heaven with all his host of rebel angels, by whose aid aspiring to set himself in glory above his peers. He trusted to have equaled the Most High if he opposed, and with ambitious aim against the throne and monarchy of God, raised impious war in heaven and battle proud with vain attempt. Him the almighty power hurled headlong flaming from the ethereal sky with hideous ruin and combustion down to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire, who durst defy the omnipotent to arms. Nine times the space that measures day and night to mortal men, he with his horrid crew lay vanquished, rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded though immortal, but his doom reserved him to more wrath. For now the thought both of lost happiness and lasting pain torments him. Round he throws his baleful eyes that witnessed huge affliction and dismay mixed with obdurate pride and steadfast hate. At once as far as angels ken he views the dismal situation, waste and wild, a dungeon horrible on all sides round as one great furnace flamed. Yet from those flames no light, but rather darkness visible, served only to discover sights of woe, regions of sorrow, doleful shades, where peace and rest can never dwell, hope never comes that comes to all, but torture without end still urges, and a fiery deluge, fed with ever-burning sulphur unconsumed, such place eternal justice had pre prepared for those rebellious. Here their prison ordained in utter darkness, and their portion set as far removed from God and light of heaven as from the centre thrice to the utmost pole. Oh, how unlike the place from whence they fell! There the companions of his fall, o'erwhelmed with floods and whirlwinds of tempestuous fire, he soon discerns, and weltering by his side, one next himself in power and next in crime, long after known in Palestine and named Beelzebub to whom the arch enemy and thence in heaven called Satan with bold words, breaking the horrid silent, thus began. If thou beest he, but oh how fallen, how changed from him who in the happy realms of light clothed with transcendent brightness did outshine myriads though bright. If he who mutual league united thoughts and counsels, equal hope and hazard in the glorious enterprise, Join with me once, now misery hath joined in equal ruin into what pit thou seest, from what height fallen, so much the stronger proved, he with his thunder. Until then, who knew the force of those dire arms? Yet not for those, nor what the potent victor in his rage can else inflict, do I repent or change. Though changed in outward lustre, that fixed mind and high disdain from sense of injure, injured merit, that with the mightiest raised me to contend, and to the fierce contention brought along innumerable, innumerable force of spirits arm, that durst dislike his reign and me preferring. His utmost power with adverse power opposed in dubious battle on the plains of heaven and shook his throne. What though the field be lost, all is not lost, the unconquerable will and study of revenge, immortal hate and courage never to submit or yield, and what is else not to be overcome? That glory shall, that glory never shall his wrath or might extort from the, me, to bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee, and deify his power, whom from the terror of this arm so late doubted his empire. That were low indeed, that were an ignominy, ignominy and shame beneath this downfall, since by fate the strengths of gods and this imperial substance cannot fail, since through experience of this great event in arms not worst, in foresight much advanced, we may with more successful hope resolve to wage by force 
or guile, internal war, irreconcilable to our grand foe, who now triumphs, and in the excess of joy, soul reigning holds the tyranny of heaven. So spake the apostate angel, though in pain, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair, and him thus answered soon his bold compeer, O prince, O chief of many throned powers that lead the embattled seraphim to war under thy conduct, and in dreadful deeds fearless, endangered heaven's perpetual king, and put to proof his high supremacy, whether upheld by strength, or chance, or fate, too well I see and rue, rue the dire event, that with sad overthrow and foul defeat has lost us heaven, and all this mighty host in horrible destruction laid thus low, as far as gods and heavenly essences can perish, for the mind and spirit remains invincible, and vigour soon returns, though all our glory extinct, and happy state here swallowed up in endless misery. But what if he our conqueror, whom I now of force believe almighty, since no less than such could have overpowered such force as ours, have left us this spirit and strength entire, strongly to suffer and support our pains, that we may so suffice his vengeful ire, or do him mightier servants service as his thralls by right of war, Whate'er his business be, here in the heart of hell to work in fire, or do his errands in the gloomy deep, what can it then avail, though yet we feel strength undiminished, or eternal being, to undergo eternal punishment? Whereto with speedy words the arch fiend replied, Fallen cherub, to be weak is miserable, doing or suffering, but of this be sure, to do aught good never will be our task but ever to do ill our sole delight, as being the contrary to his high will whom we resist. If then his providence out of our evil seek to bring forth good, our labour must be to pervert that end, and out of good still to find means of evil, which oft times may succeed, so as perhaps shall grieve him, if I fail not and disturb his inmost counsels from their destined aim. But see the angry victor hath recalled his ministers of vengeance in pursuit back to the gates of heaven, the sulphurous hail shot after us in storm, all blown hath laid the fiery surge, that from the precipice of heaven received us falling, and the thunder wind with red lightning and impetuous rage perhaps hath spent his shafts, and ceases now to bellow through the vast and boundless deep. Let us not slip the occasion where the scorn or satiate fury yield it from our foe, Seest thou yon dreary plain, forlorn and wild, the seat of desolation, void of light, save what the glimmering of those livid flames cast pale and dreadful? Listen, thither let us tend from off the tossing of these fiery waves, there rest, if any rest can harbour there, and reassembling our afflicted powers, consult how me, me may henceforth most offend our enemy, our own loss how repair, how overcome this dire calamity, what reinforcement we may gain from hope, if not what resolution from despair. Thus Satan, talking to his nearest mate with head up lift above the wave, and eyes that sparkled blazed, his other parts besides, prone on the flood, extended long and large, lay floating many a rood, in bulk as huge as whom the fable's name of monstrous size, Titanian or earth-born, that warred on Jove, Biarius or Typhon, whom the den by ancient Tarsus held, or that sea beast, Leviathan, be, sea beast Leviathan, which God of all his works creates as hugest that swims the ocean stream, him haply slumbering on the Norway foam, the pilot of some small night founded skiff, deeming some island off as seamen tell with fixed anchor in his scaly rind, moors by his side under the lee while night invests the sea, and wished at morn delays. So stretched out huge in length the arch-fiend lay, chained on the burning lake, nor ever thence had risen, nor heaved his head, but that the will and high permission of all ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark designs, that with reiterated crimes he might heap on himself damnation while he sought evil to others, and enraged might see how all his malice served but to bring forth infinite goodness, Grace and mercy shown on man by him, seduced, but on himself, treble confusion, wrath and vengeance poured. Forthwith upright he rears from off the pool his mighty stature, on each hand the flames driven backwards slope their pointing spires, and rolled in billows, leaving in the midst a horrid veil. Then with expanded wings he steers his flight aloft, incumbent on the dusky air that felt unusual weight, till on dry land he lights, 
if it were land that ever burned with solid as the lake with liquid fire, and such appeared in hue as when the force of subterranean wind transports a hill torn from Pelorus, or the shattered side of thundering Etna, whose combustible and fueled entrails thence conceiving fire, sublimed with mineral fury, aid the winds and leave a singed bottom all involved with stench and smoke. Such resting found the soul of unblessed feet. Him followed his next mate, both glorying to have escaped the Stygian flood as gods, and by their own recovered strength, not by the sufferance of supernal power. Is this the region, this the soil, the clime, said then the lost archangel, this the seat that we must change for heaven, this mournful gloom for that celestial light. Be it so, since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right. Farthest from him is blessed, whom reason hath equalled. Force hath made supreme above his equals. Farewell, happy fields where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors. Hail, infernal world, and thou profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor. One who brings a mind not to be changed by time or place place or time. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. What matter where if I still be the same and what shall I shall be all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater. Here at least we shall be free the almighty hath not built here for his envy will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure and in my choice to reign is worth ambition though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. But wherefore lest we but therefore let we then our faithful friends, the associates and co-partners of our loss, lie thus astonished on the oblivious pool, and call them not to share with us their part in this unhappy mansion, or once more with rallied arms to try what may be yet regained in heaven, or what more lost in hell. So Satan spoke, and him Beelzebub thus answered, Leader of those armies bright, which but the omnipotent none could have foiled, if once they hear that voice, their liveliest pledge of hope in fears and dangers, heard so oft in worst extremes and on the perilous edge of battle when it ranged in all assaults their surest signal, they will soon resume new courage and revive, though now they lie grovelling and prostrate on yon lake of fire. As we erewhile, astounded and amazed, no wonder fall on such a pernicious height. He scarce had ceased when the superior fiend was moving towards the shore, his ponderous shield, ethereal temper, massy, large and round behind him cast, the broad circumference hung on his shoulders like the moon, whose orb through optic glass the Tuscan artist views at evening from the top of Fazole, or in Valdano to descry new lands, rivers or mountains in her spotty globe. His spear, to equal which the tallest pine hewn on the Norwegian hills to be the mast of some great admirable, were but a wand he walked with to support uneasy steps over the burning mile. Not like those steps on heaven's azure and the torrid climb smote on him sore besides, vaulted with fire. Nathless, nathless, he so endured till on the beach of that inflamed sea he stood and called his legions, angel forms who lay in trance, thick as autumnal leaves that strow the banks in Valombrosa, where the Etrurian shades high o'erarched and bower, or scattered sedge afloat, when with fierce winds Orion armed hath vexed the Red Sea coast, whose waves all through Bacirus and his Memphian chivalry while with perfidious hatred they pursued the sojourners of Goshen, who beheld from the safe shore their floating carcasses and broken chariot wheels. So thick bestrown, abject and lost lay these, covering the flood. Under amazement of their hideous change, he called so loud that all the hollow deep of hell resounded, Princes, potentates, warriors, the flower of heaven once yours now lost, if such astonishment as this can seize eternal spirits, or have ye chosen this place after the toil of battle to repose your wearied virtue, for the ease you find to slumber here as in the vales of heaven? Or in this abject posture have ye sworn to adore the conqueror, who now beholds cherub and seraph rolling in the flood with scattered arms and ensigns, till anon his swift pursuers from heaven's gates discern the advantage, and ascending tread us down, thus drooping, or with linked thunderbolts transfix us to the bottom of this gulf. Awake, arise, or be forever fallen. 
They heard and were abashed, and up they sprung upon the wing, as when men wont to watch on duty, sleeping found by whom they dread, rouse and bestir them sounds ere well awake. Nor did they not perceive the evil plight in which they were, or the fierce pains not feel, yet to their general's voice they soon obeyed innumerable. As when the potent rod of Amran's son in Egypt's evil day waved round the coast, up called a pitchy cloud of locusts warping on the eastern wind, that all the realm of impious Pharaoh hung like night, and darkened all the land of Nile. So numberless were those bad angels seen hovering on wing above the cope of hell, twixt upper nether and surrounding fires, till, as a signal given, the uplifted spear of they great, their great sultan waving to direct their course, in even balance down they light on the firm brimstone and fill all the plain, a multitude like which the populous north poured never from her frozen loins to pass Rhine or the Denor, when her barbarous sons came like a deluge on the south and spread beneath Gibraltar to the Libyan sands. Forthwith from every squadron and each band, the heads and leaders thither haste where stood their great commander. Godlike shapes and forms, excelling human, princely dignities and power that erst in heaven sat on thrones, though of their names in heavenly records now be no memorial, blotted out and raised by their rebellions from the books of life. Nor had they yet among the sons of Eve's got new, them new names to wandering all the earth, through God's high suffering for the child of man. By falsity and lies, the greatest part of mankind, they corrupted to forsake God their creator and the invisible glory of him that made them to transform oft to the image of a brute, adorned with gay religions full of pomp and gold and devils to adore for deities. Then were they known to men by various names and various idols through the heathen world. Same muse, their names, then known, who first, who last, roused from the slumber on that fiery couch at their great emperor's call, as next in worth came singly where he stood on the bare strand, while the promiscuous clouds stood yet aloof. The chief were those who from the pit of hell, roaming to seek their prey on earth, just fixed their seats long after the next, long after next the seat of God. Their altars by his altar, gods adored among the nations round, and durst abide Jehovah thundering out of Zion, thrown beneath the cherubim, yea, often placed within his sanctuary, often their shrines, abomination, and with cursed things his holy rites and solemn feasts profaned, and with their darkness durst affront his light. First Moloch, horrid king besmeared with blood of human sacrifice and parents' tears, Though for the noise of drums and timbrels loud, their children's cries unheard that passed through fire to his grim idol. Him the Ammonite worshipped in rubber and her watery plain, in Argob and in Basan, to the stream of utmost Arnon. Nor content with such audacious neighbourhood, the wisest heart of Solomon he led by fraud to build his temple right against the temple of God on that opprobrious hill and made his grove the pleasant valley of Hinnon, Hinnon Tophet thence and black Gehenna called the type of hell. Next, Camos, the obscene dread of Moab's sons from Aror to Nebo and the wild of southmost Arborim, in Hesebon and Horanim, Sion's realm, beyond the flowery dale of Sibma clad with vines, and Eliel to the asphaltic pool, Peor his other name, when he enticed Israel in Sittim on their march from Nile to do him wanton rites, which cost them woe, yet thence his lustful orgies he enlarged even to that hill of scandal. By the grove of Moloch homicide, lust hard by hate, till good Hosea drove them hence to hell. With these came they who from the bordering flood of old Euphrates to the brook that parts Egypt from Syrian ground had general names of Baalim and Ashtaroth, those male, these feminine. For spirits, when they please, can either sex assume, or both so soft and uncompounded is their essence pure, not tired or manacled with joint, joint or limb, nor founded on the brittle strength of bones like cumbrous flesh, but, within, but in what shape they choose, dilated or condensed, bright or obscure, can execute their airy purposes and works of love or enmity, enmity fulfil. For those the race of Israel oft forsook their living strength, and unfrequented left his righteous altar, bowing lowly down to bestial gods, for which their heads as low bowed down in battle, sunk before the spear of despicable foes. 
With these in troop came Ashtoreth, whom the Phoenicians called Astarte, Queen of Heaven, with crescent horns, to whose bright image, nightly by the moon, Sidonian virgins paid their vows and songs. In Zion, also not unsung, where stood her temple on the offensive mountain, built by that exorious king, whose heart, though large, beguiled by his fair idolatresses, fell to idols foul. Thamuz came next behind, whose annual wound in Lebanon allured the Syrian damsels to lament his fate in amorous ditties all a summer's day, while smooth Adonis from his native work ran purple to the sea, supposed with blood of Thamuz yearly wounded. The love tale infected Sion's daughters with like heat, whose wanton passions in the sacred porch Ezekiel saw. When by the vision led, his eye surveyed the dark idolatries of alienated Judah. Next came one who mourned in earnest, when the captive ark maimed his brute image, head and hands locked off in his own temple on the Grunsel edge, where he fell flat and shamed his worshippers. Dagon his name, sea monster, upward man and downward fish, yet had his temple high reared in Azotus, dreaded through the coast of Palestine in Gath and Ascalon and Acheron and Gazas frontier bounds. Him followed Rimon, whose delightful seat was fair Damascus, on the fertile banks of Amana and Farfar, lucid streams. And he, he also against the house of gold, God was bold. A leper once he lost and gained a king, Ahaz, with his sottish conqueror, whom he drew God's altar to disparage and displace for one of Syrian mode, whereon to burn his odious offerings and adore the gods whom he had vanquished. After these appeared a crew under, who under names of old renown, Osiris, Isis, Horus and their train, with monstrous shapes and sorceries abused fanatic Egypt and her priests, to seek their wandering gods disguised in brutish forms rather than human. Nor did Israel escape the infection when their borrowed gold composed the calf in Oreb, and the rebel king doubled that sin in Bethel and in Dan, lightening his maker to the grazed ox, Jehovah, who in one night, when he passed from Egypt marching, equaled with one stroke both her firstborn and all her bleating gods. Belial came last, than whom a spirit more lewd fell not from heaven, or more gross to love vice for itself. To him no temple stood or altar smote, yet who more oft than he in temples and at altars when the priest turns atheist, as did Eli's sons, who filled with lust and violence the house of God, in courts and palaces he also reigns, and in luxurious cities, where the noise of riot ascends above their loftiest towers, and injury and outrage, and when night darkens the streets, then wander forth the sons of Belial, flown with insolence and wine, witness the streets of Sodom, and that night in Gabeah, when the hospital, hos, hop, hospitable door exposed a matron to avoid worse rape, these were the prime in order and in might. The rest were long to tell, though far renowned. The Ionian gods of Yavin's issue held gods, yet confessed later than heaven and earth their, bo their boasted parents. Titan, heaven's firstborn, with his enormous brood and birthright, seized by younger Saturn, he from mightier Jove, his own and Rhea's son, like measure found. So Jove usurping reigned. These first in Crete and Ida known, thence on the snowy top of cold Olympus, ruled the middle air, their highest heaven, or on the Delphian cliff, or on Dodona, and through all the bounds of Doric land, or whom with Saturn old fled over Adria to the Hesperian fields, and all the Celtic roamed the utmost isles. All these and more came flocking, but th with looks downcast and damp, yet such wherein appealed, obscures some glimpse of joy to have found their chief not in despair, to have found themselves not lost in loss itself, which on his countenance cast like doubtful hue, but he his wanted pride soon recollecting with high words that bore semblance of worth, not substance, gently raised their fainting courage and dispelled their fears. Then straight commands that at the warlike sound of trumpets loud and clarions be upreared, his mighty standard, their proud honour claimed, Azazel at his right, a cherub tall, who forthwith from the glittering staff unfurled the imperial ensign, which full high advanced, shone like a meteor streaming to the wind, with gems and golden lustre rich and blazed. 
seraphic arms and trophies, all the while sonorous metal blowing martial sound at which the universal host upsent a shout that tall he tore hell's concave and beyond frighted the reign of chaos and old night. All in a moment through the gloom were seen ten thousand banners rise into the air with orient colours waving. With them rose a forest huge of spears and thronging helms appeared, and serried shield in thick array of depth immeasurable. Anon they move in perfect phalanx to the Dorian mood of flutes and soft recorders, such as raised to height of noblest temper heroes old, arming to battle, and instead of rage deliberate valour breathed, firm and unmoved. With dread of death, to flight or foul retreat, nor wanting power to mitigate and swage with solemn tortures, troubled thoughts, and chase anguish and doubt and fear and sorrow and pain from mortal or immortal minds. Thus they, breathing united force with fixed thought, moved on in silence to soft, pipe, soft pipes that charmed their painful steps o'er the burnt soil. And now advanced in view they stood, a horrid front of dreadful length and dazzling arms, in guise of warriors old with ordered spear and shield, awaiting what command their mighty chief had to impose. He, through the armoured files, darts his experienced eye, and soon traverse the whole battal battalion views. Their order due their visages and statues, stature as of gods, their number last he sums. And now his heart descends, distends with pride, and hardly in his strength glories, for never since created man met such embodied force, as named with these could merit more than that small infantry, warred on by cranes, though all the giant brood of Phlegra with the heroic race were joined that fought at Thebes and Ilium, on each side mixed with auxiliar gods, and what resounds in fables or romance of Uther's son, begirt with British and Armoric knights, and all who since, baptised or infidel, jousted in Aspremont or Montalban, Damasco or Morocco or Trebizond, or whom Berserta sent from Afric shore when Charlemagne with all his peerage fell by Fontab Fontarabia. Thus far, these beyond compare of mortal prowess, Yet observe these dread commander, he, above the rest, in shape and gesture proudly eminent, stood like a tower, his form had yet not lost all her original brightness, nor appeared less than archangel ruined, and the excess of glory obscured, as when the sun new risen, looks through the horizontal misty air, shorn of his beams, or from behind the moon, in dim eclipse, disastrous twilight sheds on half the nations, and with fear of change perplexes monarchs. Dark and so, yet shone above them all the archangel, but his face deep scars of thunder had entrenched, and care sat on his faded cheek, but under brows of dauntless courage and considerate pride, waiting revenge, cruel his eye, but cast signs of remorse and passion to behold the fellows of his crime, the followers rather, far other, once beheld in bliss, condemned forever now to have their lot in pain, millions of spirits for his fault immersed of heaven, and from eternal splendours flung for his revolt, yet faithful how they stood, their glory withered, as when heaven's fire hath scathed the forest oaks or mountain pines, with singed top, their stately growth, though bare, stands on the blasted heath. He now prepared to speak, whereat their doubled ranks they bend from wing to wing, and half enclose him round with all these peers. Attention held the mute, thrice he aside, and thrice, in spite of scorn, tears such as angels weep, burst forth. At last, words into woe with sighs found out their way. O myriads of immortal spirits, O powers matchless, but with the Almighty and that strife was not inglorious, though the event was dire, as this place testifies, and this dire change hateful to utter. But what power of mind, foreseeing or presaging from the depth, of knowledge past or present could have feared how such united force of gods how such as stood like these could ever know repulse for who can yet believe though after loss that all these puissant legions whose exile hath emptied heaven shall fail to reascend self-raised and repossess their native seat for me be witness all the host of heaven if counsels different or danger shunned by me have lost our hopes but he who reigns monarch in heaven till then as one secure sat on his throne, upheld by old repute, consent or custom, and his regal state put forth at full, 
but still his strength concealed, which tempted our attempt and wrought our fall. Henceforth his might we know, and know our own, so as not either to provoke or dread new war. Provoked our better part remains, to work in close design, by fraud or guile, what force affected not, that he no less at length from us may find, who overcomes by force, hath overcome but half his foe. Space may produce new worlds, whereof so rife, they went a fame in heaven that he ere long intended to create, and there implant a generation whom his choice regard should favour equal to the sons in heaven. Thither, if but to pry, should be perhaps our first eruption, thither or elsewhere, for this infernal pit shall never hold celestial spirits in bondage, not the abyss long under darkness cover. But these thoughts, full counsel must mature, peace is despaired, and who can think submission? War then, war, open or understood, must be resolved. He spake, and to confirm his words, out flew millions of flaming swords drawn from thighs of mighty cherubim. The sudden blaze far round illumined hell. Highly they raged against the highest, and fierce with grasped arms clashed on their sounding shields the din of war. Hurling defiance towards the vault of heaven, there stood a hill who's not far, whose grisly top belched fire and rolling smoke. The rest entire shone with a glossy scurf, undoubted sign that in his womb was hid metallic ore, the work of sulphur. Thither winged with speed, a numerous brigade hastened, as when bands of pioneers with spade and pickaxe harm forerun the royal camp to trench a field or cast a rampart. Mammon led them on, Mammon, the least erected spirit that fell from heaven, for even in heaven his looks and thoughts were always downward bent, admiring more the riches of, he riches of heaven's pavement, trodden gold, than aught divine or holy else enjoyed in vision beatificate. beatificate. By him first men also, and by his suggestion taught, ransacked the centre, and with impious hands rifled the bowels of their mother earth for treasures better hid, Soon had his crew opened into the hill a spacious wound and digged out ribs of gold. Let none admire that riches grow in hell, that soil may best deserve the precious bane. And here let those who boast in mortal things and wondering tell of Babel and the works of Memphian kings. Learn how their greatest monuments of fame and strength and art are easily outdone by spirits reprobate, and in an hour, what, in an age, they with incessant toil and hands innumerable scarce perform. Nigh on the plain, in many cells prepared that underneath had veins of liquid fire, sluiced from the lake, a second multitude with wondrous art founded the massy ore, severing each kind and scummed the bullion dross. A third as soon had formed within the ground a various mould, and from the boiling cells by strange conveyance filled each hollow nook, as in an organ from one blast of wind to many a row of pipes the soundboard breathes. Anon, out of the earth, a fabric huge rose like an exhalation with the sound of dulcet symphonies and voices sweet, built like a temple where pilasters round were set, and Doric pillars overlaid with golden architrave. Nor did they want cornice or frieze with bossy sculptures grave. The floor was fretted, got the roof was fretted gold, not Babylon nor great Al Cairo, with such which magnificence equalled in all their glories to enshrine Belus or Serapis their gods, or seat their kings when Egypt with Assyria strove in, we in wealth and luxury. The ascending pile stood fixed, her stately height, and straight the doors, opening their brazen folds, discover wide within her ample spaces or the smooth and level pavement. From the arched roof, pendant, pendant by subtle magic, many a row of starry lamps and blazing cressets fed, with naphtha and asphaltus yield light as from a sky. The hasty multitude admiring entered, and the work some praise, and some the architect, his hand was known in heaven, by many a towered structure high, where sceptred angels held their resonance, and sat as princes, whom the supreme king exalted to such power, and gave to rule, each in his hierarchy, the orders bright. Nor was his name unheard or unadored in ancient Greece, in the Orsonian land. Men called him Mulciber, and how he fell from heaven, they fabled, thrown by angry Jove, Sheer all the crystal battlements, from morn to noon he fell, from noon to dewy eve, a summer's day, and with the setting sun dropped from the zenith like a falling star on Lemnos, the Aegean isle.
Thus they relate erring, for he with this rebellious rout fell long before, nor aught availed him now to have built in heaven high towers. Nor did he escape by all his engines, but was headlong sent with his industrious crew to build in hell. Meanwhile the winged heralds by command of sovereign power, with awful ceremony and trumpet sound through the host proclaim a solemn council forthwith to be held at Pandemonium, the high capital of Satan and his peers. Their summons called from every band and squared regiment by place or choice the worthiest. They and on with hundreds and with thousands trooping came attended. All access was thronged, the gates and porches wild, but chief the spacious hall, though like a covered field where champions bold want, ride in armed, and the soldan's chair defied the best of Paynham's chivalry to mortal combat or career with lance. Thick swarm both on the ground and in the air, brushed with the hiss of rustling wings. As bees in springtime, when the sun with Taurus rides, pour forth their populous youth above the hive in clusters. They among fresh dews and flowers fly to and fro, or on the smoothed plank, the suburb of their straw-built citadel, new rubbed with balm, expatiate and confer their state affairs. So thick the airy crowd swarmed and were straightened, till the signal given, behold a wonder. They but now, who seemed in bigness to surpass earth's giant sons, now less than smallest dwarfs, in narrow room throng numberless like that pygmean race beyond the Indian mount, or fairy elves, whose midnight revels by a forest side or fountain some belated peasant sees, or dreams he sees, while overheard the moon sits arbitress, overhead the moon sits arbitress, and nearer to the earth wheels her pale course. They on their mirth and dance, intent, intent with jocund music, charm his ear, at once with joy and fear his heart rebounds, thus in corporeal spirits to smallest forms, reduced their shapes immense and were at large though without number still amidst the hall of that infernal court but far within and in their own dimensions like themselves the great seraphic lords and cherubim in close recess and secret conclave sat a thousand demigods on golden seats frequent and full after short silent then and summons read the great consult began please join me for book two